Uh, BGP Communities 101. So, um, well, this talk is about BGP Communities, obviously. Um, my name is Gerd. I think everybody in the room already knows me. My AS number is 5539, and that's actually irrelevant information because half the examples use um, this AS as sort of like the central point. And it's because I just looked at my configs uh, instead of just making something up. Um, usually there should be like five marketing slides, space and is totally cool. And if you need a, a nice place to house your servers and everything, just bring it to us. And I save you that I don't have that much time. Um, the, the overview of the talk is what are BGP communities? Why do I want to use them? And how do I do that? Sort of like obvious. So, what is a BGP community? Um, no, it's not a social network of the 1970s. Um, but the, the term is totally misleading. Um, what it is, is a 32-bit number which can be attached to a BGP prefix and then used to do something with it. Um, it's called communities because the original RFC authors uh, thought of it as a method to group together prefixes with uh, similar uh, properties. So it's a community of prefixes, um, but I don't think anybody thinks in these terms anymore. So it's just a number. Um, it's a 32-bit number. 32-bit numbers get long and sort of like um, hard to remember. So they came up with a format where you use 16-bit colon 60-bit to write down the 32-bit number and uh, to sort of like make obvious where this community has a, uh, has a meaning or relevance, um, you put your ACE number in the upper half. So everything relevant for Spacenet is 5539 colon, and then a number that has uh, significance for us. There's a few numbers that have uh, predefined significance, but most numbers are just numbers. Good morning, everybody. Nice that you show up uh, so early as well. So what do you do with these BGP communities? Uh, it's a BGP remote control mechanism. You have one router that um, tags a community to a prefix. It's really just like sticking a yellow note on the prefix. This prefix has 5539500 now. And then BGP transports the prefix with the number attached to it through your network. And some other router can then look at the community and make a decision. And that can be anything that you can configure in the route policy of, of that box. So how, how do communities look like? This is a real world example. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. Mm. This nice, wonderful, magic beamer thingy um, just stopped working. No, it do doesn't. It should point a yellow circle there. Uh, now it's trying the other one. Now it stopped doing anything. The, the, the nice thing about this one is that you can actually see it uh, in the video stream. So, well, anyway, I tried with the mouse pointer. So this is this is a BGP prefix um, I, I'm, I'm using as an example here. Uh, I'm using real numbers because I can, and because you can then look at your BGP tables and verify that what I'm telling you is uh, actually true. That's slash 24 is mine, so I'm free to use it as an example. It has been lended to the Debian Anycast project, so it's actually used outside uh, our network right now, which is good because I have BGP path to demonstrate and play with. So um, this is the output of, of show BGP from an iOS XR box. And you see um, here's community values. These are the ones that have significance for, for my network. And the other ones are uh, communities set by somebody else. So this one is uh, obviously coming from Cable and Wireless uh, Vodafone. And I could look up in their documentation what uh, 22,000 means. It has no significance to us, but um, 
you, you might do filtering on it like this is a cable and wireless customer or cable and wireless peering in Germany, UK, whatever. These are coming from obviously 6A39, and these ones are uh, actually D kicks uh, who ran out of number space, so started using um, sort of private number um, space. I'm coming back to that later on. So, do I need communities? The answer is no. You're all, all geeks. Anytime somebody presents a new technology to you, half of you will say, oh, I don't need this. I can do it the way I've always done it. I can do it with Puppet and Salt, and nobody needs communities. Um, strictly speaking, this is true. Um, whatever you do with communities, you can do with manual work, like a customer calls you up and you spend three hours reconfiguring half your network, or you spend half a year writing nice puppet salt automatization to just avoid using communities. But if you understand communities, you know that um, you actually want them. Um, stealing a quote from, from a talk from Job Snyders at the last RIPE meeting. When in doubt, always use BGP communities. That's actually a very nice talk if you want to uh, learn more about uh, BGP policy mechanics and so on. When in doubt, always use communities. So, um, what, what actually prompted me to, to give this talk? Um, I, I looked at uh, two different customer networks last year, um, and they were trying to do everything right, and in the end they got it still wrong, <laughs> because they were not using communities. And um, I was discussing this with people on the IRC channel and got the feedback, yeah, but communities are so complicated and I never got the hang how to start with it, so this is why I'm here. This is a pretty, pretty standard uh, network. You have 54339 as a transit provider here, 5404 as the second transit provider of 8481 uh, down there, and uh, global transit 2914, that's NTT up on the top. You have customer relations, so this customer announces his prefix up there with that AS path. He also announces it here, so nothing uh, special. And since these two ASs are peering, um, 5539 sees that prefix over the peering link as well. Um, upwards to 2914, we have a very strict prefix filter, so only prefixes that should be announced to the upstream providers are announced, so there's a very strict check here. If it's not 193.31.7.0, it will not be permitted. So. The prefix matches, we announce it, everything is good. Is it? So what happens if that link breaks? Obviously, these two announcements go away. So this router will then check, OK, do I have something else to announce? And looking in his uh, BGP tables, he finds, oh, yes, the prefix is still there with that path. So we're announcing a uh, appearing path to an upstream provider now. Do we want that? Most definitely not. But if you just do filtering on prefix, um, the prefix doesn't know that this prefix was learned over peering and not over um, downstream. So that's um, obviously wrong. But this happens to real life networks all the time. The moment you connect the downstream customer that you also see over peering links, um, you leak path that you are not supposed to do. Of course, you can fix this. So add a proper AS path filter here that verifies that you only announce the prefix if the AS path is right. Then the customer starts doing prepends and his pre uh, prefix is not propagating properly. Then you connect new customers uh, and all of a sudden for every customer you connect somewhere in your network, you have to update all the routers elsewhere in the network because all these prefix filters need to be rolled out somewhere. That's where Puppet and SaltStack and so on come in, so this can all be automated. You don't need communities, but with communities, it's way easier. What you do with communities is um, you basically, at every ingress in your network, you put a community on the route that says where it was learned from. 
When it's coming from here, it gets community 5439250. When it's coming from here, it gets 5439100. If it's coming from here, it gets 5439500. These numbers are totally arbitrary. They are just there um, because I had to make up numbers. They have no underlying significance in BGP. They are just numbers. Come back to that later on. So the customer announces the prefix as before. Now we have a, a, a route map here that says if the prefix is in the list of permitted prefixes from the customer, we tag a community on it. 5539500 signals this is a customer prefix. On the egress to 2914, we have a check that doesn't check for prefixes anymore. Uh, no AS path filter, no prefix list filter. All the route map does is um, it matches the community with this community list. This is just a name. And if 5539500 is in the list, then the prefix is permitted. And in the outage case, um, we have the prefix over the other uh, path as well, as before. Nothing changed here. At the DE kicks ingress, we set 5539100 5, because that's what we have defined as a DE kicks route gets 5539100. 5, and the export to 2914 will automatically do everything right because the check will see there's no 5539500 5, on the prefix anymore. So it's not a customer route. If it's not a customer route, do not export it. Solved. And the beauty of that is actually when you attach, uh, when you connect a new customer or a zillion new customers or the customer have new prefixes or new ASs or do prepends or whatever, everything you always have to only have to do is here, uh, extend the prefix list what you permit in, inbound from your customer. But all the other stuff in your network can stay static. Yes, we have good automatization that not touching a device is definitely more robust than perfect automatization. Because nothing can go wrong if you just leave it alone. One of the good things of this is it also fails safely. So if you forget to set a community somewhere, you misconfigure that box, and on ingress from DE6, um, the route doesn't get any community at all it will still not leak, because if it has no community, it does not have 5539500 either. So that's actually a very robust way to build your network. So, nice. When I have this, can I do more interesting things with it? Yes, you can. I have a couple of more examples. Um, this is what people do, like... Um, permit their customers to control where the prefix propagates to, inform their customers where a prefix is coming in. So the customer can, can decide, yeah, well, DE kicks I want uh, over the left ISP and um, USA traffic over the right ISP, because the community will tell it um, where the prefix is coming from. BGP-based uh, null routing is also um, using that mechanism. So export control. 8481 says um, DE kicks has a, a, a 5539 has a too slow link to DE kicks. So we need hundred, hundreds of gigabits for uh, Debian Anycast. And um, we are just not using SpaceNet for it. SpaceNet is too slow. So we have something new here. The customer actually sets a community here. What com community to set? Um, they look up in our documentation. Then the prefix is announced to us, fairly box standard. Um, what's new here is we set the customer community and we set it additive. So we keep what the customer is sending us and we add a new, new label to it. Without the additive, we just remove everything that's there and stamp the new community value on it. Um, upwards to 2914, everything uh, works as before. Because 5539 is on it, we uh, permit the announcement. But toward the eKicks, we have a new rule now. The outbound list to the eKicks has a, a clause that says 
if the community matches this list, which is 5539.11.03, set as path prepend, prepend three times. So the prefix goes out with uh, three time prepend. And that's pretty much what the customer wants. Make the path to DE kicks worse. There's other communities for one time prepending or not announcing to DE kicks at all. Which, which of those makes sense depends on what the customer wants in this scenario. Like he wants backup over DE kicks, but not no announcement. So prepend might be the right thing to do. What I've not shown here is that the ingress path works similar. So ingress here at the customer, um, he can look at the communities I send him and have a rule that says if there's 5539100, meaning coming from DKIX, do the prepend. So it's uh, symmetrically prepended, all by magic of communities. You can, you can do more interesting things like transitive communities. So we have DKIX. DKIX has like something like 900 peers. Um, we don't have peerings with all 900 peers because that's just a waste of human lifetime. We use the route server, which gives us all the 900 peers uh, in one BGP session. Um, but what if I just want two of them and not all of them? I can use the DKIX communities to influence it. DKIX has uh, documented a nice list of what communities they have and uh, how it works. And the customer can then set communities that are not for us, but that are for the DKIX route server AS6695. I just propagate the prefix, and the DKIX route server will then look at the communities, and the combination says, do not announce to anything by default, but do announce to these two so 513 uh, and 680 get the prefix, and everybody else gets nothing. What you can already see here is that the numbering is a bit awkward, because um, 6695 is four DKIX, but DKIX has a number of different things that you can uh, try to influence, like prepend here, do not announce there, do announce there, so the number space is too small. And what do you do if you want to not announce to a 32-bit AS? So you put the 32-bit AS in here, but that's a 16-bit field. So stupid. 32-bit is never enough. They should have known at IETF. So the, the original community is 32-bit, uh, um, written as 1616. And um, that, that fails with 32-bit uh, AS numbers. And it also already fails with more complicated scenarios where you want to have um, m multiple different actions, um, two different target ASs, like um, <laughs> what you do in the DEX context. There's extended communities. Um, that, that's a sort of like typical IETF document. Uh, it is complicated, hard to use, and still not enough. So. Um, I only know very few networks that, that use that. DKIX actually um, offers this um, for route server control uh, when you have something that doesn't do large communities yet. The new standard is large communities, um, which had a, if, if you're interested, uh, read up the discussions because it was quite exciting. Um, Job Snyders again, thank you. Uh, who pushed for a very, very, very simple standard. It's just a 96-bit number, written as 32, colon 32, colon 32. It has no special bits, no reserved things, no... Uh, these two bits signify something else than the rest. Um, it's just a long number. It's not extendable, not TLV format, not complicated. And uh, there was quite a bit of resistance, like, oh, this is not properly extendable anymore, and what if you need something more or something special? But this got through in, in a year, while the proper IETF fully extendable large, uh, long community standard didn't get anywhere for 10 years now. So simple is good. What can you do if you have uh, three groups of 32-bit each? You can do, this is for 6695, this is what 6695 is supposed to do with it, and this is to whom. 
So what can be 0, 1, 100, 102, 103? And PRAS is just the up to 32-bit PRAS. And with what you can say, do not announce, 0. Do announce, 1. Prepend two times, 102. This is just numbers. Um, it's all on the DE Kicks page um, in, in, in big details. Um, but having enough space in your community means you can um, make it easy to understand, um, visually easy for humans that look at your communities to see what, what is he trying to do. So, cool thing. The, the underlying concept of large communities is exactly the same as with um, standard communities. One router attaches it to the attribute, uh, to, to the BGP prefix, and something else um, reacts on it. Uh, more details, examples for all the platforms are on, on that URL, um, which is on the last page as references. Um, so, <coughs> um, a last example on, on import control. So, I have this customer who has now two links to 5539. He has one big link, which connects like in Munich, and he has one, one very small backup link, like a 2 mbit line or whatever, that connects in Frankfurt. And because we are cheap, we don't have enough routers in Frankfurt, so it actually connects to the same router that the DEX connection is uh, connected to. So, the customer wants us to not use the backup link, because it's a backup link. But if, if it's connected here, the chances that the router will just prefer it, because, hey, I have a direct link to the customer, just use that. So that's not good. Again, configure time on my end, puppet, salt, whatever, or communities. So the customer announces the prefix to us, to both routers, and on the backup path, he sets uh, our documented community 5539 um, 3070, which signals to the box up there. If this community is seen, set local preference 70 which means this is way lower than anything else. So that router now has two, two routes. One goes here, which has local pref 500, because that's the standard customer local preference. And the second one over here with 70, which is so low, it does not want to use it as long as something else is there. And if traffic comes in, it will just bypass the backup link and go to the primary link, which is the way it should be. All the rest basically works the same. You, you try to figure out what you want to offer, then you define numbers, and then you build the route maps or route policies to, to make your routers do the right thing when communities come in. So, numbering scheme. What numbers do you choose? That's actually a hard one. Because um, there's no like IETF document that says you must do it that way. Because no, no two networks are equal. Um, what works for me might definitely not work for NTT. Um, what works for NTT is total overkill for a small network that just has three connections. So you find something that um, has everything in it that you need, and then you try to build a numbering scheme that is short of logical and sort of understandable for humans looking at your configs. What we do is we have a three-digit three digit AS, no, three-digit communities that signal where the prefix is coming from. 5439:1xx is uh, peering, 2yy is upstream, 500 is customers. And then we have four-digit um, AS four-digit community numbers that customers can set. And we try to keep the XXYYs uh, in line. So um, if like colon 120 is INXS in Munich, colon 1, 120, uh, colon 120 Z means influence towards INXS. We, we, got a, we, we did a few mishaps, so our, um, it's not totally uh, in sync, but that was the idea. Documented, documented, documented. And 
use distinct ranges for what your customers can set and what your, your network <laughs> itself sets. Because what happens if a peer decides to make fun of me and just send me the 5439500 community? My network will say, oh, cool, this is a customer, and propagate that prefix everywhere. So we have prefix, le le um, prefix leaks again. So when you do community-based signaling in your network, make sure that you only accept communities that you actually want to accept. Because otherwise, uh, peerings will do funky stuff with your network. Uh, you can override all communities on inbound, just do set community foo, which means remove everything at foo, or you do additive, but then you have to remove um, communities that you don't want. Here's two examples for iOS and iOS XR, which I'm not going into detail because uh, Momo is waving at me that I should get to the point and uh, get off the stage. The slides will be available. iOS is uh, a bit complicated. This is why there's lots of comment in here. Um, iOS XR is really nice. You just say delete community and then you specify the ranges you want to get rid of. And then there's two more slides with uh, how a full customer in policy or a full DKIX out policy would look like in our network, which I'm not going into. So I'm finished four minutes before time. Questions? Thank you, Gerd. Are there any questions, remarks? A remark from me, I was. Thank you for the slide with the scrubbing. I think that's the most important point if you use the additive keyword anywhere in your config. Yes, and thank you for actually the wonderful DEKIX community documentation because it really explains how small communities, extended communities, large communities work. It pointed to all the RFCs and so on. And if you go to the DEKIX booth, and that's my sales pitch, we have them printed out and you can grab them. Okay, questions? Of course, all the slides are available online, so if you want to look that up. If there are no more questions, then... Ah, okay. There's one. Gerd, um, this is Benedict from DKIX, actually one of the route server guys. Um, have you had a look at our new looking glasses where you can see all your communities um, even in color and with a meaning attached to it? Not, not yet. I saw the, the mail with the announcement and that's uh, definitely a very cool thing. But I was a bit busy with this talk thing uh, in, in the last week. Yeah, of course. If you want to understand the DKIX communities in a better way, you can have a look at the looking glass and it actually tells you what these communities do, if they have a special meaning attached. Most of them do not have special meaning attached, but uh, those who do, they are, um, yeah, th it's written in clear text what the community does on a particular route. That's definitely a cool thing. Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe only a comment. The route server itself is called the Alice Project, and uh, I hope that DKIX will soon give the sources to the public. That's not the a updated. Stefan? Stefan. Hi. Um, do you need to configure both normal communities and large communities? Um, because obviously no, not all routers uh, support large communities. This, this depends a bit on um, what your network is and what you want to achieve. Um, large communities are defined in a way that they get transported as an, as an unknown, opaque attribute. So if, if my network doesn't support large communities, but yours does, and you want to transport through my network to DKIX, um, it should just work. Because for my network, I cannot see it, it's transparent, um, but it will pass through. If you if I want to do something with large communities, I need a fairly recent version of iOS XR or Junos, like uh, 6.3 something and 17.3, to actually be able to configure, scrub, and so on, um, the large communities. But transport is fairly transparent. 
uh, Benedict from DKIX again. Um, you had the examples all with your own AS number, and yes. it was a 16-bit AS. Yes. Um, what would you suggest a network that just has a 32-bit AS number uh, when one wants to implement the same uh, logic that you laid out with your um, with the use of BGP communities um, in your network? This is the, well. This is basically the pain point that started the. We really need something now uh, with the large communities that you cannot do this with your own AS number with uh, 32 bit number uh, only. It depends on what gear you have and how old that gear is and what your customers want. Um, possibly do what the eKicks did uh, and this is use um, a private AS number as a prefix, like 65000 colon and then something and document this and um, complain to your vendors that you want large community support. But uh, fortunately, um, there's fairly few transit networks with 32-bit AS numbers. So the, the, the pain is really bad for transit networks with lots of customers, lots of peers, and those tend to be old and have four byte, um, old AS numbers. Thank you. So my time okay. is definitely over. Thank you very much. Thank you.